story is told of a, a grandfather and his grandson who had an old wicker basket, maybe something similar to this, filled with coal. And the grandfather told the grandson to empty out the coal, and he'd like a basket of water. And so he sent his grandson down to the river to scoop up some water and come running back to the home with a basket of water. How successful do you think he was? <laughs> Not very successful if you have a basket like this because the water was coming out. And the grandson was so sad and disappointed and said, Granddad, it's not working. He said, well, why don't you go and try again? So he ran down to the river and filled up his basket of water. And, and then he, he ran as fast as he could, quickly back to the house. And lo and behold, it was empty again. And he was frustrated again. I said, Granddad, it's not working. Let me go get a bucket. And I'll get, I'll, with that bucket, I'll go and I'll get, get you a bucket of water. And, he said, and the grandfather said, no, 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 I didn't want a bucket of water. I wanted a basket of water. And so the grandson ran down again to the river and he filled up his basket of water and tried his best you know, to, to keep as much water in there and came running back. And when he came back, it was empty again. And so frustrated, he looked at his granddad and he said, why are we doing this? Look, nothing is happening. I'm not able to get you a basket of water. Why can't I just use a, a bucket so that I can get you a bucket of water? This is futile. This is useless. And the grandfather looked back at his grandson and said, no, it isn't. Take a look at the basket. And he looked at the basket and that old wicker basket that was full of dirty coals and all black was all of a sudden very clean. And it wasn't black and dirty like it was before because the water had cleansed it. And I wonder if in our lives when we're practicing spiritual disciplines, I wonder in our lives when we're trying to follow Jesus, we feel like certain things are futile. Certain things that we do, we're trying and trying and failing and failing but we don't realize actually the handiwork of God in our lives working to change us and working to transform us. And maybe unbeknownst to us, we don't, we, uh, there's something that Jesus is doing to change us into the way of Jesus, into the lifestyle of Jesus, to experience the life of Jesus. And although we might feel frustrated and wondering why I'm, I'm trying this, I'm doing this, and it's not working out yet, God is working. And it's the beautiful handiwork of God in our lives in so many different ways to accomplish his purpose, not our purpose. Probably the greatest sermon ever preached was found, is found in Matthew's chapter 5, 6, and 7, known as the Sermon on the Mount. And in this sermon, Jesus outlines the qualities and characteristics of the people of his kingdom and how they should live and how they should respond and how they should act in this world. And I don't know about you, but when I read that, and if I were to make a checklist of how well I'm doing according to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, I fail miserably in so many different areas. There's so many things that Jesus talks about there, about turning the other cheek and going the extra mile and loving your enemies and, and praying and fasting and so many other things that he says that his followers, his disciples, the citizens of his kingdom will do and accomplish. And in many ways, I don't see that in my life. How about you? As we look at what Jesus is, is asking of us and what he's describing for us, there's so many times in my life that I can see I am impatient and don't display the patience of God. There's so many times in my life where I, where I see some anger that's there instead of the love of God. And as much as I want to think and hope and, and say, okay, I'm not going to get angry, 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 and then something happens, and what happens? I get angry. So, so what's the solution to this? Well, what is the way in which we can overcome some of these things? As it says here, we want to apprentice in the lifestyle of Jesus in order to experience the life of Jesus. Are there certain practices? Are there certain ways? Are there certain things that Jesus did that we can emulate, that we can follow, so that we can also experience the life of Jesus? Yes. Are there ways and means in which Jesus responded and acted that reflect the love and grace of God that we still need to grow into? Yes. So how do we get there? It's not just by hoping and wishing that we would change, but by adopting some of the practices of Jesus, 
by adopting the lifestyle of Jesus in order so that we might experience the life of Jesus. In the early church in the book of Acts, we read about a young man named Stephen. And Stephen um, preached a, an amazing message outlining the, the beautiful story arc of the Bible, of the gospel. And unfortunately, he paid with his life. And he was stoned to death. But as they were stoning him to death because he was a follower of Jesus, some of Stephen's last words were, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. I don't know about you, but I am almost 99.9% .9 sure that if I was in Stephen's shoes, I would not be praying that prayer. I would not be able to say at that moment in my life, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. I am almost 100% sure that that would not be my natural response. So why was Stephen able to respond that way? Why was Stephen able to say, Father, forgive them? Similar to the way that Jesus, when he was hanging on the cross and he was dying, what did he pray as well? Father, forgive them. How was Stephen able to adopt the life of Jesus? How was Stephen able to respond the same way Jesus responded? How was Stephen able to emulate and express the love of God in that situation where for many of us, we would not respond in the same way? I think it's because Stephen adopted the practices and the lifestyle of Jesus. And as he adopted the practices and lifestyle of Jesus, he was able to imbibe the life of Jesus. And as he was able to imbibe the life of Jesus, when the pressure situation came, when the trial came, when the difficulty came, when the hardship came, he was able to respond, not like old man Stephen, but like Jesus responded. I would love that to happen for me. Would you not like that for you? There's so many times, maybe in pressure situations, whatever's inside actually comes out, and what's inside is not a lot like Jesus. It's more like what we knew maybe years before. Have you ever experienced that? When something just comes out, and you're like, oh, where did that come from? A moment when, when we experience impatience or anger or lust or all of these unsanctified natures that might be within us and it comes out instead of what we hope would come out. Maybe someone does something to us and instead of love and forgiveness like Stephen, bitterness and envy and jealousy we see within us. How can that change? The way that can change is not just by hopeful wishing, but Jesus has made a way for us, an avenue for us, to adopt the practices of Jesus, things that he gave and left an example for us. As we adopt the lifestyle of Jesus, we also can experience the life of Jesus. And today I want to talk to you a little bit about some of those things. I'm going to go pretty quickly, but I want to talk to you about some of those practices and I want to encourage you at the end of the service to go back to our Apprenticing with Jesus wall at the back and Pick out one of those cards of something that maybe you can take a first step in, in apprenticing with Jesus, one of the spiritual disciplines that maybe you're not practicing right now. The Apostle Paul tells uh, Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. So if we want to adopt the lifestyle of Jesus, if we want to adopt the, the if we want to experience the life of Jesus, we need to discipline ourselves for the purpose of of godliness. Another translation says it like this, train yourself to be godly for physical training is of some value, but godliness has value of all things, holding promise for both the present life, so it's good for now, and the life to come. And so this is what Jesus is calling us into as we are apprenticing with Jesus, as we're following in the ways of Jesus, he's calling us into a lifestyle, a similar lifestyle to the which he lived when he was here on earth. He's calling us to practice the things that he's practicing so that we can also experience the life that he experienced, so that we can respond the way that he responded, so that when someone slapped him on one cheek, he turned the other cheek, and we also can respond that way, even though that sounds unbelievably impossible to do. If we apprentice in the way of Jesus, and if we adopt the practices of Jesus, and if we imbibe the lifestyle of Jesus, we also can experience the life of Jesus. And it's not going to happen overnight. 
It's a lifelong journey in transformation. It's a lifelong journey in discipleship. It's a lifelong journey in apprenticeship to Jesus. What is the thing that's, that, that's in your heart or in your life that you're, you're struggling with? Maybe there's a lot of self-centeredness that you see in your heart as you spend time looking deep within. There's a lot of self-centeredness. Well, is there a practice of Jesus that can help you to deal with that? Yes. It's called sacrifice. We'll look at that in a moment. Maybe there's, there, there's something in your, uh, in your heart and in your life that you're maybe addicted to and you can't live without, but you know that it's not a godly thing and it's not helping you to follow in the way of Jesus. Well, is there a practice of Jesus that can help you to deal with that addiction? Yes, it's called fasting. And so through, through the service, I want you at the same time as, we, as I share some of these practices for you also to look deep within and to be able to say, what are some of the things that I see in my life that are not reflective of the life of Christ? What are some of the things that I see in my life that are not reflective of the characteristics of the citizens of the kingdom of God? And whatever those might be, is there a practice that can counterbalance that negative action or character? Is there something in the life of Jesus? Is there a practice in the life of Jesus that he's creating an avenue for us that will counterbalance that or, 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 or work against that to take that out of our life? Right? Are there things that we can take intentional steps towards that will help us to adopt the life of Jesus. And it's not gonna be an easy thing, it's not gonna be something that changes right away, but it's uh, something that we take one step in habit forming that leads towards our character. James Clear in his book, Atomic Habits, says it this way, all big things come from small beginnings. The seed of every habit is a single, tiny decision. But as that decision is repeated, a habit sprouts and grows stronger. Roots entrench themselves and branches grow. The task of breaking a bad habit is like uprooting a powerful oak within us. And the task of building a good habit is like cultivating a delicate flower one day at a time. Maybe there is this powerful oak that is within us, a stubborn nature, an angry spirit, a bitterness that's there that's like a stubborn oak. Well, is there a practice in the life of Jesus that can help to counteract that? Is there a practice in the way of Jesus that can help to root out those things in our life that are not pleasing to him? And can I encourage you today, it's going to take some reflection, it's going to take some looking deep within to say, okay, I really need to work on this area in my life. What is a practice of Jesus that I can practice on a daily basis that can help me in this area of my life? There are some things that we can do generally that form us in the way of Jesus, We've been talking a little bit about that in this series as we talk about spiritual formation because we're all being formed in some way or in some, in some form. But are there practices that can lead us in the way of Jesus? In Matthew chapter 11, Jesus gives the invitation to learn of him. So we come to him. Come to me, all you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. Jesus' invitation to us is to come and to learn of him. Jesus' invitation is, come and I will teach you. Come and let's see the practices of Jesus so that we can adopt that in our life and that we can experience the life of Jesus. Unfortunately, many times the practices that we do, that we think of, they end up being transactional and not transformational. Sometimes in our lives we do things out of duty and there's, it's just a transaction, but it's not a transformation. Well, it's a new day, I should read my Bible, let me read my Bible. It's transactional, but not transformational. It's Sunday morning, I know I should come to church, let me just come to church and go home, but I haven't been transformed by the Spirit of God. It is transactional and not transformational. And so that's the question that we have to ask ourselves. Are we just practicing these things? Are we just doing these things out of a sense of duty like the Pharisees did? Or are they actually having a transformational change in our lives? In so many different ways in our lives, we're doing things because we want to live a godly life or we want to have the life of Jesus. We want to experience and know the love of God and show that love of God to others. But many times it's just a transaction. 
and it's not transformative. So I, I've grouped them into, into four different categories that I want to talk about this morning. Prayer, scripture, personal, and interpersonal. I don't like the personal category, just to tell you right off the bat, because I think so many of the practices of Jesus are very communal in nature. I just didn't have another word to use. Okay, but so much of what I'm going to talk to you about uh, this morning is very much communal in nature. So prayer and scripture reading, I call those two, I've shared it with you before, those are the two legs of the spiritual life. If you have prayer but no scripture reading, then you're going to be hopping around. You're just going on one leg. If you have scripture and no prayer, you're hopping around as well. And it's so much easier to fall when you're hopping, isn't it? If you don't have prayer or scripture reading, you're not going anywhere. You're not going forward in your spiritual life. Those are the two basic things. But if you have both prayer and scripture reading, these are the legs by which you can walk forward in your spiritual life. So let me go through them. I'm going to go through them very quickly. Uh, All of this you can find on our notes page online, uh, but I'm going to go through them uh, pretty quickly this morning. Number one, this first section, prayer, consistency. So within each of these categories, I'm going to tell you a few different uh, spiritual disciplines that you can find within this. So number one, consistency. Prayer is meant to be consistent. I love the way that Pete Gregg talks about prayer. He says it this way, keep it simple, keep it real, and keep it up, consistency. Let prayer be something that's consistent. As spiritual discipline, as we talked about habit forming, it needs to be consistent. Paul says, pray continually, okay? Number two, worship. Worship is an important aspect of prayer. Prayer is not just petitionary and telling the Lord what we want. Prayer is an act of worship. Prayer is the way that we adore the Lord. Prayer is the way that we worship God. In, In Ephesians, Paul says, instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God for the Father, for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is worship. Singing to the Lord, worshiping the Lord, this is an aspect of prayer. This next one you're not going to like. I don't like it too much as well, too, but it's really important. And that's fasting. Fasting is a type of prayer as well where we are denying ourselves something in order to experience the life of Jesus. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones said this, Fasting should really be made to include abstinence from anything which is legitimate and in and of itself for the sake of some special spiritual purpose. So maybe we can fast from social media. Maybe we can fast from our TV watching. Maybe we can fast from some food that we enjoy. Maybe we can fast from uh, other things that maybe give us certain joy and delight for a spiritual purpose. Are there things that are in our life that are, that are addicting to us? Are we addicted to food? Are we addicted to video games? Are we addicted to social media? Are we addicted to TV? Are we addicted to so many other things that maybe, is there a practice in the way of Jesus? Yes, fasting, that can help to counteract some of those things that we see are having a negative impact on our character, that we are not experiencing the life of Jesus in. In Matthew chapter four, it says, man shall not live by bread alone, but from every word that comes from the mouth of God. This is how we live. We live by the word of God. And so sometimes fasting is necessary so that we can experience the life of Jesus, experience the word of God. Listening. As I said before, prayer is not just petitionary, but prayer is also listening to God. Prayer is a two-way communication. If you called me, right, and, at the, and, and all you did was just talk, 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 and at the end said, okay, bye, Daniel. Do you think that'd be a very productive telephone conversation? No. But how many times in our lives when we're calling up Jesus, we're like, I need this, I need that, and can you do this? Actually, I needed it yesterday. Can you get it done tomorrow at the latest? Thank you, bye. And we don't spend any time listening to figure out what he actually wants for us, right? So listening is important as an aspect of prayer. It's a spiritual discipline that we need to cultivate. Why? Because Jesus says, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. How do we follow if we're not able to listen? So listening is key. 
So next time we get into a, in a season of prayer or in a session of prayer and we're just telling the Lord, do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. Oh, and can you do this other thing and this other thing and, and this thing? And then we just end it there without taking time to listen. Let's develop. Again, it's, this is part of habit forming. Develop the ability to listen. This is often another overlooked thing is corporate prayer. The ability that when we come together to pray, whether that's in our life groups, whether that's as a church, as a whole, that there's power in corporate prayer as we unite our hearts together. It's a discipline that's important for us as well. It's not just personal prayer, but it's a corporate aspect of prayer. As I mentioned before, all of these spiritual disciplines really have a corporate nature to it. I won't read all of the verses because I'm going through some of these quickly, but in, in Chronicles, it talks about that if God's people would humble themselves and pray and seek the Lord, then God would hear from heaven and God would answer their petition and God would see their prayer. Okay? Next group, scripture. Next larger, larger category, okay, is scripture. So what are, some of the, what are some of the disciplines within scripture that are important for us to cultivate? Number one, daily reading. Spend time in the word of God every single day. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Inasmuch as fasting is sometimes difficult to skip, most of the time we end up eating some type of food every day, unless it's intentional to fast, correct? But sometimes we say, I don't have time to read my Bible, I'm so busy. Did you have time for breakfast? Did you have time for lunch? Sometimes we get really busy and we skip a meal here and there, but most, more than likely you're not gonna skip all three meals, right? So where is our priority? What is the, the discipline that God wants us to have? Your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path, right? So let's learn to cultivate a daily time of reading God's word. Use a scripture plan in the YouVersion Bible app to be able to read through the word of God Create something that's disciplined in your life, maybe from uh, throughout the year to read through the whole Bible in one year. I'm going through a plan right now called uh, The One Story That Leads to Jesus. And it goes throughout the whole from Genesis to Revelation, pointing to the beautiful story arc of the Bible that is Jesus and redemption. Meditation. Meditation is born. This is different from maybe um, Eastern practices of meditation. Uh, it's different from New Age movements of meditation when it's about emptying of yourself. Okay, that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about emptying ourselves. We're talking about filling our mind and our heart with the gospel and with scriptures. Don Whitney uh, writes and he says this, deep thinking, this is a definition of what he says meditation is, deep thinking on the truths and spiritual realities revealed in scripture for the purposes of understanding application and prayer. This would be the Christian, Christian meditation, a little bit different from Eastern uh, religions and the meditation that some of those religions practice as well. In Psalm 1 and verse 2, it says, whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. I just said daily, you know, reading the previous slide, right? This is day and night the scriptures are exhorting us into. Study. Study is important. It's part of what we, uh, we do to dig in deeper to the, the Word of God. We host Bible Study Fellowship here on Thursday mornings, and we have hundreds of women that gather. It's a women's group that gathers here to study Scripture. There are men's groups that are out there as well, and young adult groups, and there's ways to study more intentionally and deeper in the Scriptures, and I want to encourage you, if that's something that's a spiritual discipline that can help you in other areas of your life, then dig in to studying God's Word. In, in 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2, Paul exhorts Timothy to do your best to present yourself to God as one that's approved, to study the word of God, right? So that you can rightly handle the word of God, divide the word of God, explain the word of God. Journaling. This is another thing. This is not really my thing. I'm not a really good journaler, but for some people, journaling really works. Actually, if you read through a number of the Psalms, a number of the Psalms are actually just journal entries from David. He's running away from Absalom and, Dave, and David is journaling what God is speaking to him and his prayers to God during that time when he's running away from Absalom. And so journaling can be a great thing for us as we can reflect back on God's goodness and God's faithfulness and God's help for us in our time of need. In Psalms it says, I remember the days of old because I've journaled about them. I ponder all your great works and think about what you have done. It fills us with gratitude. It fills us with hope. As we see the handiwork of God in our lives in times past, we can take confident hope knowing that he that was faithful in the times past will be faithful today and will be faithful in the future. Okay, here's another hard one. Memorization. Do you remember this? We memorized Romans chapter 8 earlier this year. Memorization is great because it fills our mind and our heart with the word of God. 
Memorization is amazing because when we, are, when we have the word of God inside of us, we can speak the word of God. We can speak the promises of God. We can pray the promises of God. And how amazing it is, is that when we memorize scripture and we pray that back to Jesus, the same word that he's promised to us, do you think he'll be faithful to provide? This past week uh, on Halloween, a w was giving away free kids' meals. So I told Joel I'll take him to a w for his kids' meal, and he was so excited. And we got there, and we got there at the wrong time <laughs> because the line was out the door. And he was like, Daddy, I'm hungry. And the line was out the door. So I said, let's go home, and we'll have, we'll, we'll have uh, some food at home. And so we went home. But as we were going home, I, I told him, I said, I said, Joelito, maybe we'll go. We'll go back in the, in the evening. So it was getting a little bit late, and I was thinking, oh, you know, should I take him back out? You know, his bedtime's coming around. But I wanted to be true to my word. If I, as a flawed, unfaithful father, want to be faithful to my word to my son, how much more will our Heavenly Father be faithful to the word that he's given to us? So isn't that an easy prayer to make? Confess the word of God back to him. Confess the promises of God. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Confess that back to him. The Lord is my refuge and strength, a very present help in time of need. Confess that back to him. As we fill our hearts and our minds with the word of God, as we memorize the word of God, we're able to declare that to others as well. Let the word of Christ Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your heart to God. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let it fill our hearts and our lives. Next section, personal. Again, don't like this category because a lot of the spiritual disciplines are very communal in nature, but some of these things are better understood personally. Number one, I'm going to give you four S's, okay? Silence, right? This is hard in all the noise of the world that we live in. Sitting in silence is very difficult. Try it. Sit in silence. I'm not even telling you to sit in silence for an hour. Sit in silence just for 10 minutes. That can be very difficult. But silence is a spiritual discipline that's important because it helps us to reflect inside and helps us to see the hand of God in our lives as well. In the Psalms it says, it says, be still and know that I am God. In in the noise around us, in the busyness of our world, let's be still and know that he is God. Along with silence comes solitude as well. Right? As we are just alone with the Lord and experiencing him in new ways. And, and you can pair these two together, silence and solitude, go off for a retreat, be on your own. Not forever. The purpose of silence and solitude is so that we can come back together in a communal nature because God has made us part of his family. But there are times that silence and solitude are important so that we can, we can get away from the rush and the busyness of things so that we can come back better into community. In um, next verse there, Luke chapter 5, but Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and prayed. Jesus often withdrew to lonely places. That was the place where he was able to find renewal and refreshment uh, in his life. Dallas Willard, the guru of spiritual disciplines, he says this, it is solitude and solitude alone. This is a pretty hefty statement here coming from Dallas Willard, Christian philosopher, guru of spiritual disciplines, spiritual formation, pathways to Jesus. It is solitude and solitude alone that opens the possibility of a radical relationship to God. That's a pretty hefty statement when I read it. Simplicity. There's so many things that clutter our world and clutter our life, but living simple in this world is also a spiritual discipline that helps us to be focused on the things that actually matter. There's so many things that divide our time and we've got to do this and this and this and this and this and the other thing, but living a simple life can help us to be able to focus on things that God really wants us to, to do. Because we brought nothing into this world and we're going to take nothing out of this world as well, right? Paul says it to Timothy in 1 Timothy, yet true godliness with contentment is itself great wealth. True godliness with contentment is great wealth. So many times we can be living this rat race of I want this and I want that and there's jealousy and there's envy and keeping up with the Joneses and I need this and I need that and I want to have the latest this and latest that, but living uh, simply before Jesus is a wonderful spiritual discipline that can work in our lives. Here's another one that we don't like to hear. Sacrifice, right? Sacrifice. 
So much of what, uh, uh, so much of what is ugly inside of us is self-centered. So much of what's ugly in our character and is not pleasing to God is because it's all about me, myself, and I. And so here's a great practice of Jesus that counteracts this self-centeredness and selfish nature and that sacrifice. Can we sacrifice for others, right? Jesus said in Luke, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow me, right? Sacrifice, it's important. Last category. Interpersonal. There's a lot that's here, so I'm going to go through this quickly. First one, community. Community is so critical, it's so important. Another word you can put here is fellowship. Fellowship is so important. Community is so important. As I mentioned before in previous messages, I won't go into a lot uh, this morning, you cannot follow Jesus alone. He's meant us to journey together in community, right? We talked a lot about that last week. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the sharing of meals, including the Lord's Supper, which we're going to partake of in a moment as well, and to prayer. Community is so important. They journeyed together. They lived together. They, they prayed together. They shared meals together. They were all together in one community. Celebration and worship, what we're doing this morning. When we gather together, I want to encourage you to create a discipline of gathering together. Let that be part of your rhythm, part of your routine. Right? In the similar way as I shared that story about the, the wicker basket and it being, after time and time again of the water going through, there was a cleansing that was happening on that wicker basket. As we put in certain routines and rhythms into our life, I'm going to worship the Lord on Sunday morning in community, in celebration, whether that's here in person or whether that's online or whatever that might be. Coming together in community is so critical and important. Hebrews says, let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Celebration, worship, service. If you want, visit the Serving with Jesus wall at the end of the service today. Find a way and a, and, and a place where you can actually serve in community. Find a place that you can give back to all that God has actually given to you, to be able to serve and minister to others to be able to, to not to think about ourselves, but to think about the good of others. Service is a very selfless approach to life because we look at serving others. In Colossians chapter three, work willingly at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Work willingly in whatever you do. God is looking for us to serve in, in, in some way and in some form. And so if you're here and you call Unionville Alliance Church your home church, I wanna encourage you to serve in some way or some form. There's lots of areas that, uh, that you could serve. And you can see how your life is gonna be touched and transformed in the way of Jesus as you serve. Generosity is another important spiritual, um, spiritual discipline where God asks us to give. God asks us to give of our time. God asks us to give of our talents. And God asks us to give of our treasures, those three Ts. Give of your time to the Lord, right? Be generous with your time. Give of your talents, the way that God has blessed you, the talents, the abilities, the good things that God has given to you, those talents, give that back to the Lord and use those talents for the glory of God. The treasures, the financial blessings that he's given to you, give that back in service towards the Lord. Give of what, how God has blessed you with. Be generous. It's a spiritual discipline that you'll see that has repercussions or, or ripple effect in so many other areas of our lives. As we live with a generous disposition, a generous posture, we'll see the Spirit of God working in our lives in so many other areas and places as well. In Acts, it says, I have been a constant example, Paul says, of how you can help those in need by working hard. You should remember the words of the Lord Jesus, it is more blessed to give than to receive. More blessed to give than to receive. Confession, this is one of those other hard ones. But this is a spiritual discipline that's important as well because we're meant to live together in community. As I mentioned last Sunday, we can't live without sin, but we can live without secrets. Secrets is the heavy burden that takes us down. Secrets are the heavy, heavy burden that allows the devil to come and condemn us. Secrets are the things in our lives, the darkness in our lives that create an open pathway for the enemy to take us in a wrong way. But as we come to the light and as we confess, a spiritual discipline of confession is something that can bring great liberty to our lives. In James it says, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. 
There's healing and there's wholeness as we confess and as we surrender and as we give our lives to the Lord, live in community through the spiritual practice of confession. Submission, another one that we don't really like as well. In the Western world that we live, it's all about single autonomy. It's about our own rights and everything. And so submission is not something that we generally like to hear about. Submission is not something that we generally want to do because we want to be able to do our own will. But uh, in the book of Hebrews, it says, remember your leaders who taught you the word of God. Think of the good that has come from their lives and follow the example of their faith. God has put leaders over us. God has put people over us. Whether you're children in a family and you have parents over you, whether you're in your workplace and you have a boss over you, whether you're in a, in a spiritual family and you have a life group leader that's leading you in, 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 in a life group setting, whatever setting that it might be, God has put people that are over us. We have elders over our church as well to help guide and lead our church. In all of these things, it's a spiritual discipline that's, that is a blessing to us because it denies our own self-will, denies uh, us of the way that we want to do things, and we come under submission to the Spirit of God. Hospitality. The Word of God encourages us to be hospitable. This is a, it's a, it's a spiritual gift, but it's also a spiritual discipline that God asks us to be hospitable to others. In Romans, it says, when God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Always be eager to practice Hospitality. Can you see how this is a discipline? Because it says, be eager to practice hospitality. Again, are there things in our life that we see uh, evil inside of us, darkness inside of us that is very just about me and myself? Well, if we see some of those things within us, then do the counter to it, the spiritual discipline that's counter to that, and practice hospitality. And as we do that, we'll see our character and our lives being changed and transformed. Witness. It's about sharing the good news of Jesus with others. Again, this is a communal aspect that the Great Commission is given to us, is given to all of us. It's not just for the pastors or it's not just for the leaders, but we are all given this command to share the gospel with others. In Acts chapter 1, it says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. So witness to others is a spiritual discipline that can be cultivated. If we find ourselves that we don't like to interact with others and be like, oh, I'm not really, Daniel, you talk about all this stuff in the community, but I'm, you know, I'm more of an introvert. I don't know about all those other things. Well, here's a practice of Jesus that can help you to be able to share the good news of Jesus and fulfill this commandment of the Lord, and that is to witness. And the last one, and I'll just mention this because I'm going to talk more about this next week. Next week, the message is going to be about the rhythms of rest so I'm going to deal with this a little bit more detail next week, but Sabbath. Sabbath is an amazing practice. It's the practice, actually, for those that are going through the Practicing the Way series, and the video that we're going to watch today is going to end up talking about the Sabbath practice. And it's not just an Old Testament command, but it's something where in the busyness of our world, we rest and we stop. And we put away the busyness that is around us to be able to practice the way of Jesus. So let's stop right now as we get ready to partake of the table of the Lord. And let's reflect and look back at what Jesus did for us and how he died on the cross for us. You would have gotten your elements as you came in, and if not, the ushers will come around with, with these elements. And we do this not as a, a transaction, but we do this as something that is transformational. We do this not as something that's a ritual, but we do this as something that is to appreciate and know the goodness of God. And so the Lord Jesus, in the night that he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had blessed it, he broke it and he gave it to the disciples, and he said, take and eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup, and when he had blessed it, he took the cup and he gave it to the disciples, and he said, drink all of it. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So I'm going to invite our elder, Les Miata, to come. He's going to pray for the cup, and Pastor Keisha is going to pray for the... He's going to pray for the bread. Pastor Keisha is going to pray for the cup. But let's just take a moment to, to, to rest and reflect and surrender to Jesus. Is there something that you need to give to him? Give that to him right now.